killer is you! I think I'd better take one more look back at the case from the beginning. Last night, the killer went to the room Sayaka was in. In other words, my room. From what we can tell, Sayaka invited that person there intending to kill them. She attacked them with the knife she'd taken from the kitchen earlier. But then something happened that she wasn't prepared for. They grabbed the fake sword I put in my room and fought back. During the struggle, a strike from the sword broke Sayaka's right wrist. And that's when she lost her grip on the kitchen knife. Finding herself cornered, Sayaka panicked and ran into the bathroom. The killer went after her, but couldn't get the bathroom door open. What they didn't know was that my bathroom door got stuck easily, and there was a trick to opening it. Sayaka knew about that because I told her, but of course the killer had no way of knowing. So instead, the killer forced the door open, took the kitchen knife, and stabbed Sayaka. But with what strength she had remaining, Sayaka left a dying message. To keep the killer from noticing, she wrote it on the wall behind her. And with that, all her strength was gone. With Sayaka dead, the killer quickly began destroying the evidence. First, they took off their shirt, which was covered in their victim's blood. Then they took the lint roller in my room and cleaned up the entire area. They wanted to make sure they got rid of any trace they'd ever been there. Afterwards, the killer headed to the trash room to destroy their bloody shirt. They tried to burn the shirt using the incinerator there. But the trash room was blocked off by an especially sturdy gate, preventing access to the incinerator. So they came up with a plan to use Hero's crystal ball, which he'd left in the laundry room. The killer managed to throw the ball through the gap in the gate and hit the incinerator switch. For any normal person, that'd be an impossible throw. But the killer had the confidence to take a shot. And that's because the killer was the ultimate baseball star. The crystal ball, thrown with absolute precision, hit the switch on the incinerator which then quickly roared to life. Having destroyed the final piece of evidence, they left the area with, I imagine, a sigh of relief. But there was one thing they missed. Part of the shirt they'd thrown into the fire burnt away and fell out of the incinerator. The killer didn't notice this, and so left behind a piece of indisputable evidence. Isn't that right, Leon? The killer is you! First, let's take a look back to before the incident. 
attacked last night, Celeste saw Chihiro in the warehouse, correct? At the time, she was apparently stuffing something into a duffel bag. That something was a blue tracksuit. You can confirm this, right, Celeste? With bag in hand, Chihiro headed out, even though it was officially nighttime. She made her way to the locker room, specifically the boys' locker room. But how could the victim, who was apparently a girl, access the boys' locker room? Simple, because she was really a he, which is why he was able to use his own handbook to gain entrance to the boys' locker room. Once inside, he met with someone there. And the person he met was the one who killed him. It seems likely that the killer grabbed the nearby dumbbell, approached the unsuspecting Chihiro, and attacked him. And that's where the blood stains on the poster and carpeting in the boys' locker room came from. It was likely in the heat of the moment. The body was arranged, but the murder itself felt unplanned. Which is why the killer hurried to try and hide the act. First, pulling up the bloodstained carpet. Then, removing the bloody poster. And finally carrying the corpse into the girl's locker room. A girl's handbook was necessary to get into the locker room, of course. But this alone doesn't prove that the killer was necessarily a girl. After all, Sayaka and Junko's handbooks had been placed in the main hall. Using one of those, a boy could get into the girl's locker room without much problem. And that's exactly how the killer did it. With the carpet and the poster they brought with them, they got to work. They changed the layout of the boys and girls locker room in what you might call a crime scene switch. That could have been the end of things, but no. Yakuya discovered the body and decided to intervene in the situation, making things even more complicated. So, after stumbling on the crime scene, he went and grabbed the extension cord from the library, and then he got to work. He used the cord to string up Chihiro's lifeless body, Then, using the victim's own blood, he left a grisly message there at the scene of the crime. He wanted to create the illusion that Genocide Jack was responsible for the slaughter. And around the same time that Byakuya was putting together this facade, the killer, having already disposed of Chihiro's bag and other belongings, arrived at the sauna. There, they plan to destroy the last piece of evidence, Chihiro's handbook. And just as the killer expected, the steamy sauna was enough to ruin the electronic gadget. Somehow, the killer knew that the handbook couldn't stand up to the heat of the sauna. And the reason they knew that is because the sauna had already wrecked their own handbook. And that's how it all played out. Isn't
Isn't that right, Mondo Arata? Here's exactly what happened. Before anything, the killer persuaded someone to help carry out the murder. And that person was... Ifumi. With an accomplice, the killer was able to execute a number of otherwise impossible schemes. First, they convinced someone to meet them in the rec room, last night at 1 in the morning. That someone they met with was Hiro. The murderous duo intended to pass Hiro off as the prime suspect. So when they met up with him, they drugged him, knocked him out, and stuffed him into the robo-justice suit. Next, Ifumi positioned himself to make it look like Robo-Justice was attacking him, while the killer used a digital camera to take pictures of the assault. They did all this just to create evidence that would put the suspicion on Hiro. When they were done with him, they shoved him, still unconscious, into the pool room locker. And then finally, at 6 a.m., they moved into the murder phase of their plan. They called Taka to the equipment room. And that's where Hifumi killed him, making it the scene of the first murder. The murder weapon was Justice Hammer 4, which was left there in the equipment room. The reason Hammer Number 4 was used was to create confusion about the order of the crimes. So, next they falsified two more assault incidents. For these attacks, the killers pretended to be the victims to solidify Robo-Justice as the suspect. The first fake incident was the attack in the rec room. There, the killers wanted us to see Justice Hammer 1, and the Robo-Justice pictures they'd taken. They wanted to make sure we bought the surprise attack story. The second fake incident was the attack in the library. This time, they planted Justice Hammer 2 and an injured Yifumi to sell us that story. With these two incidents, the killers were able to create a certain preconception in our minds. That the suspect was increasing the size of the hammers and attacking people in order as they did. We fell right into their trap and started looking for the suspect based on that, but... While we did that, we left Hifumi alone in the nurse's office. This was exactly what Hifumi was hoping for. He took a blood packet from the refrigerator and Justice Hammer 3 and turned the room into a crime scene in which he himself had apparently been brutally murdered. He let out a scream to draw us back, and when we returned, that's what we found. Meanwhile, the other group that had been out searching found Taka's body at the same time. So when we heard the body discovery announcement, we naturally assumed it was for Hifumi. We left the nurse's office, and Hifumi once again took advantage of the situation. He simply got up and made his escape. When we learned his body had disappeared, we all rushed back to the nurse's office. And once again, Hifumi had the chance he was waiting for. This time, he snuck into the equipment room. He wrapped Taka's body in a tarp 
and use the dolly to move it all the way down to the repository. That explains how each of the bodies disappear. But even Hifumi didn't know what the true killer had in mind for their final act. Their plan all along was to kill Hifumi and get rid of the one person who could betray them. And they did it using an ordinary, everyday hammer from the repository. That should cover everything that happened in this case. And the villain behind it all is... Sorry, you lose. Here's exactly what happened. This case began when Sakura asked a number of people to meet her in the rec room. Specifically, those people were Hiro, Toko, and Byakuya. But one of them headed out a bit earlier than the others, Toko. She got there one step ahead of everyone else and looked around for a good hiding spot. And she found it. She crawled into the locker to get out of sight. Then, from inside the locker, she saw Sakura enter the room. Next to arrive was Hero. When he got there, he mistakenly thought Sakura was going to try to kill him, so he panicked. Without thinking, he grabbed a nearby Monokuma bottle and attacked Sakura with it. Thinking he'd killed her, he hastily began covering up his crime. He took a magazine from the table and forged a dying message from Sakura. To that end, he wrote down a name. Toka. By writing her name, he was hoping to pin the murder on her. But of course, Toko had witnessed the whole thing. So as soon as the coast was clear, she jumped out of the locker and hid the magazine on the shelf with all the others. But in her rush, she made one little mistake. She put the magazine back upside down. Soon after, she watched as Sakura slowly opened her eyes. She also saw the blood dripping off Sakura's head and fainted. This caused her personality to switch back over to Genocide Jack. When she woke back up, her second personality also saw the blood soaked Sakura. And she freaked out. And just like Hiro, she grabbed another Monokuma bottle and attacked her. This explains why there were two wounds on Sakura's head. Assuming Sakura really was dead this time, she set about disposing of the evidence. She gathered up the broken Monokuma bottle shards and the queen chest piece. And that explains how Sakura was attacked twice with the same type of weapon. But even after those two blows, she was still alive. So then, what was Sakura's actual cause of death? It was the poison that Sakura herself got from the chem lab. She turned the rec room into a true locked room scenario and then drank the deadly mixture. 
And there, she took her final breath. Later on, the rest of us discovered that her body was in there. We had to smash the door's window to get inside. But someone already knew what had happened. Knew that she had committed suicide. And that same someone quietly snatched the bottle of poison from off the ground. And while nobody was looking, replaced it with an empty protein can. They did all this specifically to place all the suspicion on themselves. In an attempt to guide the trial to a false conclusion. And the one who went to all that effort... ...was you, Hina. The killer is... you! We met the ultimate fashionista, Junko and Oshima, right after we all arrived here. But that wasn't the real Junko. The girl we saw before us was actually the 16th student who had taken Junko's place. And that girl's name was Mukuro Ikusaba. But it wasn't long before she died at the hands of Monokuma. In other words, the mastermind, Junko and Oshima. Her body was kept in a bio lab, which had been converted into a morgue, until Junko decided to put her body to use. Junko dragged the body out of the bio lab, using the tarp to carry her to the garden. She fabricated the murder to try and friend Kyoko, who proved to be one big thorn in her side. Meanwhile, she wanted us all to think Mukuro was still alive and hiding somewhere inside the school. So she put on a mask, and then attacked me. After making sure I'd gotten a good look at the mask, she left the room. Then she put the same mask on Mukuro's body. This was all to make us think the person who attacked me and the corpse were one and the same. She wanted us to believe the murder had only recently taken place. Finally, by strapping a bomb to the body, she was able to destroy any remaining evidence. She needed to hide the body's true identity. She had to make sure we didn't find out it was actually the same person we'd met in the beginning. This is the truth behind Mukuro's murder. And the one who carried it all out is the true mastermind. The one controlling Monokuma. The real Junko and Oshima! everything that happened in this case. Let's try going over the whole incident, beginning with right after the party started. Byakuya had us gather in the dining hall of the old building near the hotel. He was extra cautious about a murder occurring that night because of a threatening letter he received. Therefore, he decided to throw a party so he could monitor us.
Though one person didn't come, the rest of us assembled at the dining hall, and the party was underway. But at that time, the trap set by a certain someone was already in motion. They plugged three irons into the outlets in the storage room, which nearly capped the power usage. Additionally, they prepared something else that would activate at 11.30 p.m. The air conditioners in the office and dining hall. They had already set the timers for these. Thanks to the irons maxing out the power usage, the breaker was tripped when the air conditioners kicked on. Since the windows in the old building were covered, the blackout plunged the dining hall into total darkness. But when that happened, Biakia took out a specific item that he brought in his case. That item was the night vision goggles. Biakia was so concerned about a murder occurring that he brought a variety of security equipment with him. When he put on his night vision goggles, Byakuya witnessed a certain someone making a suspicious move. He saw Nagito guiding himself with the desk lamp's power cord so he could get under the table. That's right, everything up to that point was all part of Nagito's plan. The murder warning to Byakuya, the source of the blackout, it was all Nagito. While the blackout was happening, someone else, the real killer, began making their move in the kitchen. The killer probably already knew about Nagito's plan, so they knew a blackout was coming. That's why the killer prepared all the items they would need to commit their crime in the dark beforehand. They needed a light source, which was provided by the portable stove in the kitchen. They needed a weapon, too. This had also been hidden in the kitchen beforehand. The long iron skewer used in the churrasco dish. The killer hid that inside that meat with the bone in it. With the weapon and portable stove in hand, the killer stepped out into the hallway. First, they closed the fire door in the hallway so their light source wouldn't peek toward the dining hall. Then, guided by the light, the killer headed toward the storage room and grabbed a specific item. That's right, a tablecloth to block the blood splatter. With this, the killer finished their preparations and snuck under the floorboards through the secret passage. They probably turned off the portable cooking stove at that point, or left it near the entrance of the door. The floor in the dining hall is full of gaps, so there's no way they could have safely held a light source. But thanks to the glowing mark they painted earlier, the killer was able to get beneath the table. Under the table, Byakuya found the knife that had been hidden there. If only he had retreated, he probably wouldn't have gotten killed. But he had to retrieve that knife, and at that moment, The killer lurking beneath the floorboard stabs straight up with the iron skewer. The killer had been waiting in the dark for the moment when the glowing paint began to move. After they murdered Byakuya, the killer purposefully shouted from beneath the floorboards to make it seem like they were still in the dining hall. 
afterward, they came out from underneath the floorboards and rushed back to the kitchen. And then, after hiding the murder weapon in the kitchen, they rejoined the group as if nothing had happened. There's only one person who would have been able to commit this crime. Especially if that person is someone who'd think of an unexpected way to hide a weapon inside food. Isn't that right, Teru Teru Hanamura? Here's everything that happened in this case. The incident began this morning when Mahiru spoke to Hyoka. Mahiru most likely played Twilight Syndrome Murder Case, the video game provided to us as the motive. She probably wanted to discuss it with someone else who also appeared in the game as a character. Hyoko accepted Mahiru's invitation, and they promised to have a more detailed conversation about it later. However, someone else overheard their exchange. The killer. The killer eavesdropped on their conversation and used their promise to devise a specific murder plan. By preparing a specific item, they plan to manipulate the two's actions. That item was the letters. They sent fake letters to both Mahiru and Hyoka. The letter Mahiru received told her to come to the beach house at 2.30 p.m. And the letter Hyoka received told her to come to the beach house at exactly 2 p.m. By providing different times, the killer was able to lure them to the beach house separately. Hyoko totally trusted that letter, showed up at the beach house at 2 p.m., just like it said. And was drugged into unconsciousness by the killer lying in wait. After putting Hyoko to sleep, the killer immediately hid her inside the closet. So they could frame her as the killer later. At 2.30 p.m., Mahiru arrived at the beach house. She was completely unaware that she had been targeted for murder. Approaching her from behind, the killer struck the defenseless Mahiru with a specific weapon. The metal bat that was left at the scene of the crime. The bat was brought down onto the back of Mahiru's head. And with that, she took her last breath. According to Mikan's autopsy, Mahiru died instantly, so she probably never knew who killed her. With that, the killer achieved their goal of killing Mahiru and began to tamper with the crime scene. They dragged Mahiru's body so that it blocked the door leading to the road. Also, the mask found at the scene of the crime was something the killer personally left. I'm not really sure why. My guess is, it's something similar to a calling card. That's how the crime scene we discovered was created. However, by moving Mahiru's body, the killer got blood splatter on them. Plus, the shower room had no water because it was out of order so they couldn't wash it off. But the killer expected something like that to happen. Instead of the shower, the killer used something else to wash the blood off their body. They used plastic water bottles that were inside the beach house refrigerator. We can assume they carried the bottles to the shower room before the sequence of events had happened. In place of showering, they washed the blood off their body with water bottles instead. 
However, they had no choice but to dispose of the empty bottles in the beach house's trash can. Littering is against the rules, and it would have taken too much time to throw them away somewhere else. After the killer washed off the blood, they hid in a specific spot inside the closet Hyoko was in. The killer hid inside the surfboard case that they had already emptied beforehand. After some time had passed, the sleeping drug used on Hyoko wore off and she woke up. I can imagine how badly Hyoko must have panicked when she came out of the closet. I mean, she made plans to see Mahiru, who lay dead right in front of her. From the shock and panic of being considered a murder suspect, Hyoko fled from the beach house. Because of that, she left footprints in the sand. Everything was a trap set by the killer to frame her. After Hyoko left, the killer finally came out of the surfboard case and placed a gummy that they brought with them to shift our suspicion toward Hyoko. Ironically, placing that gummy is what helped clear our suspicion toward Hyoko. Finally, the killer began preparing to escape from the beach house. They couldn't risk leaving their footprints in the sand, so they escaped the beach house using a different route. The small window in the shower room. However, that window is rather high up and can't be reached easily, which is why the killer used the bamboo sword they always carry with them. The killer took the bamboo sword out of its bag, tied the bag to the sword's handle, and used the sword as a step stool to reach the small window while holding the sword bag in their hand. As long as they're able to reach the window, all they had to do was pull the bag to retrieve the sword. And so the killer left the beach house and appeared before us as if nothing had happened. But their wet hair and swimsuit didn't dry right away. There also weren't any towels at the beach house. So when the killer met up with us, they said they had been swimming for a while as an excuse. So how about it? This is the truth behind the incident you caused. Isn't that right, Heko Pekoyama? Here's everything that happened in this case. The key to this incident is the surveillance camera video that only I saw. That's why I'm going to start with that to unravel the knots of this crime. When I went to the hospital with Mikan this morning, I noticed a specific thing in the lobby. The incoming signal light on the surveillance monitor was blinking ahead of the scheduled time. When I switched on the monitor, what appeared on screen was a person wearing a hospital gown and a bag on their head about to hang themselves right at that moment. That surveillance camera unit was designed for two-way communication with the hospital and the music venue. That's why I thought the signal originated from the music venue, so I immediately headed over there. That was the killer's trap. In truth, that video was recorded in a different place. The killer brought the music venue camera the night before and made their preparations in advance. And then, they filmed that video in the hospital conference room. By doing so, they tried to make me think the incident was happening in real time. When in fact, the crime had already been committed by that point. The person in the footage wearing the bag was actually the killer acting as a fake. I 
I didn't know that, so I went to the music venue and found the hanged body wearing a bag on its head. Seeing the body before me, I panicked and rushed out of there to get the rest of you guys. But that was also part of the killer's trap. After cleaning the conference room, the killer was likely watching the music venue from outside. And, as if they were switching places with me, they went inside the music venue and began working on their last trick. First, the killer peeled off the wallpaper covering one of the stage pillars, revealing Hyoko's body. When I first arrived and saw the hanged body, I didn't notice anything strange about that pillar. I didn't expect it to be slightly larger from the wallpaper or have Hyoko's body hidden inside. Next, the killer destroyed the surveillance camera that was used in the conference room. After destroying it, they mixed it with what was left of the surveillance monitor found at the crime scene. The surveillance camera the killer used was originally brought from the music venue, but when they brought it, they made sure to destroy its monitor beforehand. They wanted to hide the fact that the camera wasn't at the crime scene. In the end, the killer transformed the crime scene into a closed room. They broke one of the drumsticks from the storage room and placed it near the music venue's entrance. However, they did this to mislead us into believing that the music venue was locked from the inside. In actuality, the reason the music venue became a closed room was because of the glue. The killer sealed the door with glue and intentionally created a closed room that could be forced open. With that, the killer finished tampering with the crime scene and met up with Fuyuhiko and me. They helped us force open the music venue door, despite the fact that they personally sealed it. And they made us discover not just Ibuki's body, but Hyoko's suddenly present body as well. At the time, they pretended to be surprised, but inside, they were probably relieved that their plan worked out. Isn't that right, Mikan? This crime was orchestrated by you, wasn't it? Here's everything that happened in this case! Let's first go over the many tricks the killer prepared before they committed the crime. First, they destroyed the contact elevator. This separated Nagito and the others in Strawberry House from our group in Grape House. Next, they lured Nekomaru out by himself by turning back all the clocks in the funhouse by two hours. Additionally, in order to secure an alibi, the killer went to the Strawberry House Lounge and set the wall clock's alarm to 5.30 a.m. After finishing their preparations, the killer went to Strawberry Tower with the necessary tools in hand. They obtain these tools from the Octagon, which you can enter once you clear the final dead room. This means the killer discovered the secret of the Funhouse faster than anybody else. That secret being, Strawberry House and Grape House are actually the same building. On the morning of the incident, Nekomaru woke up and headed over to Grape Tower for a specific reason. There, Fuyuhiko, who was at the lounge by coincidence, witnessed Nekomaru. According to Fuyuhiko's testimony, that was around 5 a.m., but by that point, 
the killer had already messed with our perception of time. In actuality, Fuyuhiko witnessed Nekomaru at 7 a.m. That's also the same time Monokuma Tai Chi begins. Nekomaru went to Grape Tower to participate in that. However, because the contact elevator was broken, Nekomaru was unable to go to Grape Tower. So he decided to try going to Strawberry Tower. But the killer was waiting for him there. With the power of hamsters, they were able to press the good night button on the back of Nekomaru's neck. This forced him to enter sleep mode, rendering him immobile. From there, the killer began preparing to use the ultimate weapon. First, they set the alarm in Nekomaru's chest to 7.30 a.m. so he'd wake up. Then they tied him up with a metal wire, tied the tip of the wire into a loop, and hung it on the doorknob. After leaving Strawberry Tower, the killer then destroyed the door button to Strawberry Hall. They did this to keep us from entering Strawberry Tower. And to keep us from discovering the secret of the building structure that they used to kill Nekomaru. Then, they used the secret octagon passageway to travel to Grape House. After arriving at Grape Hall, they pressed the button to open the door to the tower. When that happened, the elevator-like floor of the tower began descending. And Nekomaru's body was still inside, dangling upside down in mid-air from the wire. The killer entered Grape Tower to see if their setup was successful. And placed a hammer on the floor to look like the weapon, then wrapped a chain around the back door. This was done to make us falsely believe we couldn't enter the tower from Strawberry Hall. With this, the killer finished their setup and tried to go back to their room using the secret passage. So they could craft their alibi when Nekomaru died from the fall. But something unexpected happened. Fuyuhiko, who saw Nekomaru earlier, was still at the lounge. As a result, the killer couldn't return to their room, and with no options available, time ran out. The lounge's wall clock alarm started ringing at 5.30, well, actually 7.30. To avoid a worst-case scenario, the killer was forced to appear in front of Fuyuhiko with the others. When the wall clock's alarm rang, that was also the same time Nekomaru was waking up. He woke up while he was still hanging upside down, so he couldn't help but sway his body powerfully. Originally, the loop of wire was only supposed to slip off the doorknob. But because there was a heavier load than expected, the doorknob ended up breaking. Nekomaru fell from the fourth floor all the way to the first floor. He crashed into the pillar, which decapitated him on impact, and died. The sound of Nekomaru's impact echoed throughout the funhouse. However, by this point, the killer's plan was about to fail, thanks to the broken doorknob and for Yuhiko. Meaning, the killer is someone who wouldn't have heard the alarm if they were in the deluxe room. They also wouldn't have been able to return to their guest room, because Fuyuhiko was at the lounge.
That someone is Gundam Tanaka. I can't think of anyone else but you. Here's everything that happened in this case. The person who actually arranged this incident was the victim, Nagito Komaeda. He kept a specific item inside his cottage that he needed for his plan. Monokuma's special poison, which he brought with him from the octagon. Using the gloves and gas mask that he got from the military base. Nagito swapped the contents of a fire grenade he took from the plushy factory break room with that poison. When he did that, a specific item was left as evidence, the blue aluminum seal on the grenade. With that, Nagito finished making the poisoned fire grenade, took it with him to the factory, and put it back with the rest of the grenades in the break room. The next morning, Nagito appeared before us and declared that he hit a bomb somewhere. While we were looking for the bomb, that's when Nagito headed over to the goods warehouse. In order to set up a fire, Nagito arranged the Monokuma panels in a line going from the door to the curtain and placed an oil lighter in front of it. From there, Nagito set his insane plan in motion. First, he hung the spear that he took from Nozumi Castle from the ceiling girder by its cord. Then he tied his arms and legs at the back of the warehouse with rope. However, he burnt off the rope on his right arm beforehand. In doing so, he made sure that only his right hand was free while his remaining arm and legs were tied up. As he gripped the tip of the rope hanging over the ceiling girder with his left hand, he lay down face up, just beneath the dangling spear. But this was just the beginning of Nagito's plan. And then, he did something no one could have predicted. First, he covered his mouth with duct tape, and after making sure he was unable to scream, he stabbed himself with the knife multiple times in his left arm and in both of his thighs. Finally, He propped the knife on the plushie and slammed his right hand onto the blade. He didn't just want us to think he was tied up, he also wanted us to think he'd been tortured. Through all this, Nagito never let go of the spear. His plan still wasn't over. In fact, it was just about to begin. Meanwhile, we finally arrived at the plushy factory and found Nagito's message. After seeing his message, we instantly made our way to the warehouse. But that was part of Nagito's plan. We opened the door to the warehouse, which inadvertently started the Monokuma panel domino effect. fell one after another until they reached the lighter, tipped it over, and ignited the curtain. Shocked by the sudden fire, we rushed to the factory's break room to obtain some fire extinguishing grenades.
We then aimed for the fire's origin point, which was the curtain, and unloaded the entire supply. It never occurred to us that one of those grenades was the poison grenade that Nagito had prepared. The poison sank to the floor, instantly vaporizing due to the intense heat, and spread everywhere. The poison gas quickly drifted to the curtain at the back of the warehouse, where Nagito was. Also, Monokuma's poison has a unique quality in which it becomes heavier than air when vaporized. That poison gas completely surrounded the area where Nagito lay face up on the floor. There, Nagito inhaled the poison, and if it didn't instantly kill him, he certainly lost consciousness. which caused him to let go of the rope in his left hand, and the falling spear plunged into his stomach. This is all the information related to Nagito's plan. His true intention was to set one of us up as the killer. At this time, we still don't know who the killer is, because the killer wasn't aware they killed someone. Try as we might, we cannot reach that truth. That was Nagito's trap. In conclusion, the fact that we can't determine the killer's identity. This is the truth of the case. It all began two days prior, when Monokuma gave us the additional motive. The time limit added to this killing game triggered the crime. After the announcement, some of us decided to form groups to plan our next move. I had my own plan to find the mastermind, and someone offered to help me. At the time, I never would have imagined they would become the culprit. To expose the mastermind, the culprit and I set up hidden cameras in the library. There was a hidden door in the library that showed signs of use. We deduced that the mastermind would return there to let Monokuma out. The next day, we asked Mew if she could modify some cameras for our trap. We then went to the warehouse to gather the necessary materials. All we needed were disposable cameras and a security sensor. But the culprit found something else there. The murder weapon. That's right, the shot put ball. They put the cameras as well as the shot in their backpack. Then, on the day the time limit would expire, the day of the murder, the culprit and I collected the modified cameras from you and visited the library. Once there, we searched the room for ideal locations to place the cameras. But even then, the culprit was preparing the murder. They began by removing the vent grate and laid it inside the air duct. Then, they moved the pile of books on top of the bookcase pretending to organize them. After that, they placed open encyclopedias on the final bookcase. It appeared innocuous enough, 
but it was actually a path for the murder weapon. The culprit also tampered with the hidden camera linked to the security sensor. I was responsible for setting up the other cameras, but that one, I didn't even notice their trick. They used duct tape to keep the flash function on. After the cameras were set, the culprit and I climbed the stairs to the first floor classroom. We kept a lookout for the others and waited for the security sensor to go off. During the stakeout, we saw Kaito and six others go down to the basement. Rantaro was with them, the first victim. After watching that group into the game room, I returned to the classroom. With about one hour remaining, the security receiver I was holding went off. I assumed it was the mastermind, so I ran out of the classroom to the library. I was in such a hurry, I left the culprit behind. Looking back on it now, that was the last chance I had to stop the murder. After I had left, the culprit took the shot put ball out of their backpack and rolled it into the classroom vent. This set the murder in motion. Rantaro had moved the bookcase, triggering the receiver. Unbeknownst to him, the trap had been sprung. First, the modified camera took a picture of Rantaro with the flash on. Rantaro noticed the flash and approached the bookcase to inspect the camera. The camera flash lured Rantaro directly into the murder weapon's path. The shot the culprit tossed into the vent rolled through the air duct. came out of the library's vent and kept rolling atop the bookcase. Opening the vent grate and organizing the books was all to create a path. Under normal circumstances, the victim would have been alerted by the noise. But the promotional video was masking the sound of the shot rolling. The shot kept rolling, then fell on Rantaro's head, killing him instantly. By the time we had entered the room, the murder was complete. I imagine, seeing Rantaro's body, the culprit probably thought, The mastermind is dead, the game is over, now we can all go home. But their wish didn't come true, because Rantaro wasn't the mastermind. It was murder, in an attempt to save all our lives. That is the truth. That's the truth behind your lies, Kaede Akamatsu, the ultimate pianist. This is the truth of the case! The victim's body was found this morning during Himiko's underwater escape act. When we saw the piranhas in the tank, we thought that Himiko's escape failed. Of course, it was all part of the act. Himiko's escape went perfectly. 
But when Angie opened the curtain in front of the tank, we saw Ryoma with piranha swarming around him. Before any of us could react, the piranhas devoured Ryoma's body. And all that was left were his bones and the handcuffs he was wearing. That horrifying sight was the finishing touch on the culprit's own twisted magic trick. The culprit obfuscated the time and place of the murder, implicating Himiko in the process. In truth, the crime began last night, around 8.55 p.m. While preparing for the show in the gym, the culprit had a chance to be alone. It was then that the culprit used the ladder to reach the piranha tank and removed the glass lid to put inside the tank. They used it as a partition to force the piranhas to one side of the tank. Next, the culprit took the rope from the stage wing in the gym. And used the ladder once more, this time to climb up to the gym's window. Once there, they opened the window and tied one end of the rope to the window frame. The rope was then thrown out the window toward the pool. These preparations were key for the culprit's elaborate plan. Nighttime, past midnight, the culprit asked Ryoma to meet at his lab. All the pieces were in place. The culprit was ready to murder. First, the culprit knocked Ryoma out, probably striking him from behind. Then, they put the handcuffs from the shower room on Ryoma's wrists. And shoved his head into the sink filled with water. From the water and the pain of drowning, Ryoma should have woken up and struggled. The culprit anticipated his resistance, which is why Ryoma was handcuffed. The struggle left scrapes on the cuffs and sink, but in the end, Ryoma succumbed. Ryoma was dead, but the culprit's plan had only just begun. They removed the cable from the tennis net and hung it from the window facing the pool. And then, at the pool, they connected the wire and the rope from the gym window. They returned to the lab after picking up one last thing. The rubber inner tube that was in the pool's tool shed. Once back in the lab, the culprit pulled the cable, bringing up the rope. He 
it cold until the rope was taut, then tied it to the lab's window frame. And thus, the gym and the lab windows were connected by a single rope. After making a hanger of sorts with another length of rope tied to the inner tube, they hung the inner tube on the rope connecting the windows. That's how the culprit created the ropeway that was used to move the body. An impressive premeditated murder, but the culprit made two crucial mistakes. The culprit got on the inner tube with Ryoma's body and slid toward the gym. With the height difference between the windows, they would have built up quite some speed. To avoid crashing through the window, the culprit used a brake. They used their own hand to grip the rope and slow down. That would have caused significant rope burning had the culprit not been wearing gloves. But due to the friction, part of a glove tore off and dropped in the pool. Regardless, the culprit reached the window and put Rioma's body into the piranha tank. The glass pane not only kept the piranhas and the body separated, it also kept the piranhas so close together, they concealed the body. After that, all the culprit had to do was untie the rope and the inner tube. But that's when they made their second mistake. One end of the rope came loose, and the inner tube dropped into the pool. Thus, the culprit was forced to leave two key pieces of evidence, the fabric and the inner tube. They couldn't retrieve the evidence because of the rule against swimming at nighttime. the whole story. Am I wrong, Kirumi Tojo? The ultimate maid? This is the truth of the case! Let's look back at the first murder. It was late last night. The culprit was in the empty room on the fourth floor. The culprit was preparing the seance murder they had planned. To use the floorboard as a seesaw, they had to cut the cross piece supporting it. The plan was to make the same preparations for all three empty rooms. This would divert suspicion away from the culprit and whoever picked a room. To cut the cross pieces, they needed a saw. I imagine they got one from the warehouse. They were planning to cut the cross pieces in all three rooms. However, when the culprit was working on the middle room, the unexpected happened. Angie walked into that room and saw the culprit making their preparations. She needed some fire for the ritual, and had gone to the room for a candle. At that point, the culprit had not finished the setup and was just cutting cross pieces. Angie might not have concluded that it was tied to some kind of murder plan, but now that Angie had seen it, the culprit couldn't use the seesaw trick. Any other person might have just given up, but not our culprit.
the culprit took the floorboard they loosened and struck the unsuspecting Angie in the head. The culprit did not want to give up on their plan and had to improvise. They wrapped duct tape around Angie's injury to stop the bleeding. Then they picked up her unconscious body and carried her to a research lab. While she was unconscious, the culprit hurried to tie up this loose end. But because they were in a hurry, they made a crucial oversight. They didn't notice the duct tape had peeled off and was under Angie's body. Without that evidence, we may never have figured out the culprit's trick. Carrying the supplies they needed, the culprit returned to the ultimate art lab. Lock the front door from inside and took out the katana they brought from their own lab. They then stabbed Angie in the back of the neck, finally killing her. Then, to further confuse us, the culprit attempted to make a locked room mystery. First, they used rope from the warehouse and hung four effigies upside down. There were two reasons for this. To overwhelm the room with an occult atmosphere. And the other was the key to locking the room. The culprit stuck the katana into Kaede's effigy near the rear entrance. And spun the effigy around to twist up the rope. After enough turns, the culprit let go and headed for the rear door. Once released, the effigy began spinning and the gold leaf katana with it. The handle of the katana then hit the sliding lock, locking the door. A difficult trick, but remember that the lock was so loose it moved at the slightest touch. The culprit also would have had the opportunity to attempt it many times. Once complete, the door was locked, but the duct tape was left behind. Perhaps the culprit noticed it, but by that point, it was too late. The room was sealed. There was no way for them to get back inside. Then, this morning, we opened up the room and discovered Angie's body. But the culprit wasn't finished. They wanted one more murder. To do that, they manipulated us into performing this seance. Of the three empty rooms, the middle one was chosen for the seance. I was invited by Kokichi to take Kibo's place in the seance. Tenko volunteered to be the medium, but she never imagined it would get her killed. To perform the seance, the culprit claimed they needed something for Tenko. A small stone that Himiko had brought from the courtyard. 
Kenko, at the culprit's request, bowed her head until it was touching the stone. That position was instrumental in making sure the murder went as planned. Next, Kokichi and I placed the iron cage over Tenko in the middle of the magic circle. The culprit then volunteered to drape the white cloth over the iron cage. We didn't realize it at the time, but that was a deliberate decision by the culprit. They needed to set up the murder weapon that was used to kill Tenko. While they were covering the cage with a cloth, they secretly placed the sickle. Finally, four of us placed the wooden statue on top of the cage. The culprit used the weight of the statue to keep the murder weapon in place. After the preparations were complete, we began the seance. In complete darkness, we each stood in one corner and sang the Caged Child song. When the song finished, the soul of the dead was supposed to enter the medium. But our culprit had another plan, to commit a murder in the darkness. Right after we started singing, the culprit began making their way toward Tenko. It would have been quite difficult to do in total darkness, but our culprit had a guide. They used the lines of the magic circle drawn with salt. The culprit felt for the salt and used it to guide them along. And when the culprit reached the center of the circle, they found the floorboard that had its cross piece cut off the night before. then lifted up their foot and stomped down hard on the floorboard. The floorboard lifted up like a seesaw and pushed Tenko's body up toward the ceiling of the cage. Tenko was stabbed in the back of the neck by the sickle on the top of the cage. She was killed right before our eyes and we didn't even see it. After committing the crime, the culprit followed the salt back to their corner. Finished the ritual and had us light the candles. We followed the culprit's directions and removed the equipment used for the seance. And discovered Tenko's body. While we were all focused on the body, the culprit picked up the sickle and dropped it under the floor through the hole in the corner of the room. Ironically, the final step of the murder was unwittingly carried out by us. The culprit had planned the murder so that we would unintentionally destroy some evidence. That evidence was the magic circle that the culprit used to navigate in the dark. However, the culprit didn't know that Kibo had taken a picture. He really saved us. Without that, we wouldn't know what changes were made to the circle. But now we know for certain, and we know the culprit drew the magic circle.
Kureki Oshinguji, the ultimate anthropologist. You're the culprit behind these murders. This is the truth of the case! The case began last night. After being convinced by Mew, we all logged in to the virtual world. To log in, you have to plug the memory and consciousness cords into the device. So, we all plug those cords into our helmets and enter the virtual world. But the culprit had accidentally plugged their cords into the wrong ports. Because of this, a connection error occurred between the culprit's brain and their avatar. As a result, the culprit would forget everything that happened in the virtual world. It's possible that this had an effect on their avatar's personality as well. Because I... I can't believe that someone so kind could commit murder. But we had no idea this error even happened. And so, we all logged in one by one. Meanwhile, Mew was the last to log in. She had modified the killing game simulator so she could accomplish a specific goal. After Mew confirmed we were all logged in, she took out the bottle of poison. And placed it on Kokichi's seat. This was done to make it look like Kokichi was killed by poison when we returned. Yes, the reason Mew modified the simulator and brought us to the virtual world was to kill Kokichi in the virtual world, but make it look like he had died in the real world. After we had all logged in, Mew explained the world to us. Use the salon phone to log out. Objects are unbreakable. Your avatars use all five senses. She also explained the map of the virtual world in the mansion's entrance hall. But her explanation was intentionally false. She wanted us to misunderstand the world. However, one of us was able to see through her scheme. The very person Mew was trying to kill, Kokichi. Kokichi was going to use Mew's plan against her and plotted her murder. But Kokichi wouldn't do it himself. He used a patsy to be the culprit in his case. Kokichi was tight-lipped about the motive, so I don't know why the culprit agreed. But it seems as though right after logging in, when Kokichi and the culprit went outside, they were already working together to execute the murder. Eventually, we met up with Kokichi and crossed the river to the chapel. Mew had us split up to try to find some secret of the outside world. Kaito, Kokichi, Gonta, Tsumugi, and I investigated the mansion, while Maki, Himiko, Kibo, and Mew investigated the chapel. Splitting us up was also part of Mew's plan. At the chapel, Mew told Maki that she was going to look around outside. She chased after our group while we were heading toward the mansion.
Once she made sure we were across, she dropped the bridge into the river. This was to trick us into thinking that the river separated the mansion and chapel. At the time, we thought nothing of it. It was just another one of Mew's pranks. That's why we continued with the original plan to find the secret of the outside world. We went to the mansion and split up to look for clues. Kokichi searched the salon. Kaito searched the roof. Tsumugi searched the dining room. I searched the kitchen. And finally, the culprit searched outside the mansion. Around that time, Mew was headed for the wall that was on the side of the chapel. She passed through the wall and headed for the mansion to kill Kokichi. You see, the wall was a special wall that Mew had added herself. This wall was programmed so that only objects could pass through. And Mew had changed her avatar settings from human to object. That was the hidden route she prepared for herself. She set up a wall that only she could pass through. Mew headed toward the mansion, but she was seen by Tsumugi on the way. When she entered the mansion, she pulled out her cell phone. She didn't tell us that there was another way to log out. Then, she spoke a name into the phone, which forced that person to log out. It was Kaito who was on the roof at the time. The same roof where Kokichi and Mew were going to meet. By having Kaito search the roof and then forcing him to log out, she was making him look the most suspicious, but her plan didn't go smoothly. Kokichi was waiting on the roof with a culprit and the toilet paper used to kill Mew. While Mew was distracted by Kokichi, the culprit snuck up from behind. And used the toilet paper from the mansion's bathroom to strangle Mew. This was only possible because objects in the virtual world are unbreakable. Mew's avatar was strangled to death, and the shock killed Mew in the real world. After the murder, Kokichi left the cleanup to the culprit and left the roof. He probably returned to the salon as soon as he could to avoid drawing suspicion. The culprit then took the lattice from the storage room and placed Mew's body on top along with the hammer and the cell phone. Culprit heaved the lattice over the railing and forcefully slid it down the roof slope. With a body on top of it, the lattice became a makeshift sled and flew off the roof. It went through the wall that only objects can pass through before crashing into the chapel. 
That was the crashing sound that Kibo heard in the chapel and we heard in the mansion. Mew's wall hid the fact that the mansion and chapel were actually right next to each other. That's why Tsumugi and I were able to hear the crash from the mansion. As the final step, the culprit had to then get off the roof. Because we were at the mansion, they couldn't take the stairs or they'd be seen. So they used the toilet paper again to escape from the rooftop. They hung the toilet paper from the binoculars on the roof and used it like a rope to climb down. Once the culprit was safely on the ground, they pulled at the toilet paper to retrieve it. They would have returned it to the bathroom, but they ran into us as we were leaving the mansion. In a panic, the culprit tossed the toilet paper somewhere nearby. Without that one little mistake, we might never have solved this case because the culprit doesn't remember. This is the truth you've forgotten, Gonta Kokuhara, the ultimate entomologist. This is the truth of the case! Let's go over the trick that Kokichi and the culprit created together. Last night, Kibo saw Himiko from the window of his lab. She was carrying a black case and heading to the Exosol hangar. When she reached the hangar, she handed the case to someone through the bathroom window. That someone is the culprit of this case. Locked in the bathroom, the culprit had asked Himiko to bring them a certain weapon. A disassembled crossbow from Maki's lab. The culprit was going to use the crossbow to challenge Kokichi to a fight. Some time passed, and Maki made her way to the hangar. She was going to the hangar to kill Kokichi and save the culprit trapped in the bathroom. However, the hangar had an electric barrier preventing her from entering. Fortunately for her, she had an electro hammer to get around the barrier, in a way. She used her electro hammer to disable an exosol and climbed inside. She knew exosols could bypass the barrier, so she got inside one. Around that time, the culprit and Kokichi began their confrontation. While Kokichi was checking up on them, the culprit ambushed him with a crossbow. But the culprit didn't intend to kill Kokichi. They just wanted to disable him. That's why the culprit aimed for Kokichi's right arm. If they really wanted to kill him, they would have shot him in his vitals. Kokichi reeled from the arrow, and the culprit jumped on him immediately. He didn't want Kokichi to have the chance to summon an exosol with the remote. While they were fighting, something happened that caught them both off guard. The shutter of the hangar opened, and an exosol stepped inside. Kokichi was definitely not expecting an exosol to interrupt them. He pulled out his remote in an attempt to control the Exosol. But Maki leaped out of the cockpit and shot Kokichi with her crossbow. The arrow hit Kokichi right in the back, and it was no normal arrow. 
The tip was covered in a lethal poison from my lab called Strike 9 Poison. The poison kills slowly. It seems as if Maki wanted Kokichi to confess before he died. But even with poison in his veins, Kokichi continued to spin his lies. When she had had enough, Maki tried to finish him off with another poisoned arrow. But this time, Maki was the one caught by surprise. To keep Maki from becoming the Blacken, the culprit used their body to shield Kokichi. The culprit's left arm was struck by a poison arrow. Maki remembered that there was an antidote in my lab and immediately ran off to get it. The Strike 9 poison slowly circulated through their systems and would soon kill them both. But in that desperate situation, Kokichi thought up a clever lie. He incorporated this unforeseen event into his plan to help him win the killing game. Or should I say, help him defeat Monokuma. That was Kokichi's true objective. It's why he claimed to be the mastermind. Thinking fast, Kokichi closed the shutter so that Maki could not re-enter the hangar. Thus, Kokichi's final lie was set into motion. When Maki returned with the antidote, she couldn't get back inside the hangar. So she went around to the hangar bathroom and passed the antidote through the window. But after the culprit was given the antidote, Kokichi immediately snatched it. Kokichi drank down all of the antidote while the culprit and Maki watched in horror. Maki must have been panicking, thinking the only antidote was now gone. She believed that the culprit was going to die from her own poisoned arrow. But it was all another one of Kokichi's lies. He had only pretended to drink the antidote. Maki tried desperately to break into the hangar, even slashing the control panel. But she couldn't get the shutter to open again. Defeated, she had no choice but to leave. After Maki had left, Kokichi took out another weapon. An electrobomb capable of disabling communication devices for hours. Kokichi's plan was to use an electrobomb to knock out Monokuma's surveillance cameras. That was why he commissioned Mew to make the bombs in the first place. After detonating an electrobomb, Kokichi coerced the culprit into drinking the antidote. In exchange for the antidote, Kokichi asked the culprit to cooperate with his plan. Kokichi needed to work with the culprit to execute his final lie. Under normal circumstances, the culprit would never have agreed to such a plan. But because the culprit owed him for saving their life, they agreed to Kokichi's request. Ah, uh, request is a generous term. It was more like blackmail. In any case, the two were now working together as accomplices in an insane plan. There was a lot to prepare and not a lot of time. They had to work fast. If Kokichi died from the Strike 9 poison, the whole plan would be ruined. After fabricating the scene in the bathroom, the culprit dragged Kokichi to the hydraulic press. This is how the swipe pattern bloodstain from the bathroom to the press was created. Kokichi, with the support of the culprit, stood in front of the press's control panel. The two of them were finally ready to execute the insane lie. 
while Kokichi was setting up the video camera near the hydraulic press's control panel. The culprit laid face up inside the press, draping their coat over their shoulders. Then, Kokichi activated the press and the camera's record button at the same time. The hydraulic press came down slowly, all caught on tape for us to see. Normally, the safety function would have triggered, but the electrobomb had disabled it. The press got lower and lower, and just as the culprit disappeared from view, Kokichi pressed the force stop button and the camera's pause button simultaneously. The two then switched places and also switched roles. The culprit and the victim. The would-be victim became our culprit and started up the press and camera. Kokichi had saved the culprit's life because his trick required their cooperation. He wanted to win the killing game, even if it meant dying himself. And so, Kokichi was crushed by the press, and the whole thing was caught on video. The culprit's left sleeve was dangling from the press, making us think he was the victim. Now alone, the culprit collected the video camera and tore the hydraulic press's power cord so that it could never be raised again. This would make it impossible for us to determine the identity of the crushed body. But there was another reason the victim was killed in this way. It obfuscated the cause of death, making the case that much more difficult to solve. This was all part of Kokichi's plan to create a murder not even Monokuma could figure out. With the press disabled, the culprit returned to the bathroom to flush Kokichi's clothes. Finally, they climbed inside of an exosaw to hide and waited with bated breath. And here they are now in this trial, pretending to be Kokichi. They're trying to deceive Monokuma in order to defeat the true mastermind. And that's it. That's Kokichi's unidentified culprit trick. The culprit is in that exosol. It's you, isn't it? Kaito Momota, the ultimate astronaut. This is the truth of the case. With this new evidence, let's look back at Rantaro's murder. The night of the incident, Kaede and I were in the first floor classroom. We were waiting for the mastermind to trigger the trap we set in the library. Around that time, there were four people in the dining hall, including the mastermind. The mastermind was probably irritated that no murders had yet occurred. After the motive was given, they knew that Kaede was planning something. But the mastermind wanted some insurance. They would take action if necessary. The mastermind excused himself from the dining hall and went to the bathroom. And from there, to the hidden room in the library that only the mastermind could enter. And there they waited. With less than an hour before the time limit expired, Rantaro moved the library's bookcase, which set off the receiver I was holding.
It all happened the way we determined in the first trial, except at the end. I ran out of the room, and Kayede rolled the shot put ball into the air vent. At the same time, Rantaro was lured by the flash of the hidden camera Kayede said. He unwittingly stepped right into the path of the shot. The shot rolled down the path Kaede made, and then... ...fell right onto Rantaro's head, killing him instantly. Or so we thought. It turns out, that was just what the Mastermind wanted us to believe. In reality, Kaede's murder plan happened quite differently. The shot put ball that Kaede rolled didn't actually hit Rantaro. He must have been surprised seeing the shot put ball drop out of nowhere like that. But his fate was sealed. The mastermind saw that Kaede's plan failed and stepped in to finish the job. The Mastermind jumped out of the hidden room and attacked Rantaro from behind. And in their hand, the real murder weapon, their own shot put ball. Rantaro wasn't killed by Kaede's shot, but by the Mastermind's. The Mastermind picked up Kaede's shot and left their shot put ball at the scene. They also looted the Survivor Perk monopad from Rantaro's body. Those things in hand, they retreated back into the hidden room. I remember seeing the bookcase closing just as Kaede and I got there. The mastermind had probably just finished their crime. And so, the real truth was perfectly hidden from us. We went to the class trial and reached the truth that Kaede was the culprit. But that truth had been twisted by the mastermind. After the murder, the mastermind left the stolen monopad on the table in the hidden room. And threw Kaede's shot put ball into the trash can. A little careless of them to not get rid of all the evidence. They probably believed no one would ever get into that room, but we did. Their crime complete, the mastermind went back through the hidden passageway. The passageway led from the hidden room all the way to... the girls' bathroom on the first floor. While the mastermind was pretending to use the girls' bathroom, they were actually using the hidden passageway. That's how they moved around without being noticed. Anyone could have used the hidden passageway, not just the people in the dining hall. But looking at the survivors, only you could possibly be the mastermind. If 
if I'm wrong. Please, refute me. Please tell us you aren't the mastermind. Tsumugi Shirogane, the ultimate cosplayer, 